there was this uh, gentleman who was really, really proud to be a father of six children, a father of six children. In fact, he was so proud that he would often call his wife, hello, mother of six, and it was annoying. She hated it. She asked them all the time not to do it. And then one day they were at a friend's house and there was a bunch of people there and they were getting ready to leave. And he just shouts in the crowd, come on, let's go home, mother of six. And out of frustration, she replied, okay, father of four. <laughs> Marriage, romance, sex, parenting. These are all things that we are going to be touching on today as we talk about misplaced affections. Misplaced affections. So listen, I'm just going to say this. I'm going to say some stuff that um, because of the culture that we are raised up in is probably going to be offensive uh, because of our understanding of love and, and our understanding of what it means to be friends with people, what it means to have relationships with people, what it means to be a parent, what it means to be a mom, a dad, or, or, or to be a spouse. Um, our culture has certain ways and certain things in which they speak into that, and today might seem a little offensive to that, but I hope that you will take all of this and receive it, and not just receive it, but realize the reality and the truth and the love of Jesus Christ that is behind what it is that's being said. Know this, my daughters are sitting right here in the front row. One is 12 and one is eight. And uh, so uh, I am very cognizant of the fact that they are here. But nonetheless, if we don't talk about these things, then they will get their information from other sources and other places and other spaces. And in fact, many of you uh, probably were the same, in the same place. You got the bulk of uh, your understanding of love and relationships and all of that from other places, your understanding of family and what family should be from television and movies and books and what have you. And so we are going to be bringing up something that is going to start picking at the very idols of our heart. Amen? All right. If you weren't uncomfortable enough, just hold on, okay? Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and 30. Whew, Lord, pray for me, y'all. Jesus says this, you have heard that it was said you should not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to stumble into hell. Now, isn't that inspirational? That, that should go on a coffee mug or something, right? <laughs> Love is such a fuzzy word, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it's such a fuzzy word. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys, do you ever have junk drawers in your house? Anybody have a junk drawer, that drawer that just kind of gets all the miscellaneous stuff? And you're, just, you're not sure what's in it, but there's just a bunch of stuff. Right, and it's just packed full of stuff. I feel like love is that word, it is that way. That, that we, we say things like, I love God, but we also say, I love coffee, right? It's like, oh, okay, well, uh, right? It's generic, it's, it's, it, 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 it's flat, it's all inclusive. And so therefore, it doesn't have a lot of substance. It doesn't have a lot of bite to it, right? And, and even when we think about the phrase falling in love, right? Like when you're holding your newborn baby and you're falling in love, or maybe you're in a relationship and you're falling in love, or maybe you're watching a show and at first you're like, oh, I don't know, but then pretty soon you're like, actually, I'm falling in love with this show, right? I mean, it's just, you know, what does that even mean, right? I never forget, you know, Beck and I, we met at university, but after university, graduation, all that stuff, uh, our lives are, are cross paths again. And, and one Sunday, unbeknownst to me, uh, her and her family were uh, beginning to attend the church that I was at. And, and up, through the, up through the stairs, here comes Becca. And something was different. So, something about her just changed. And all of a sudden, I saw her, and I just fell in love. I mean, I just fell in love. I said, hello, Mrs. Pethybridge. What should we name our kids? Like, it was done, right? She had her purple blouse on. She three-barreled her hair. She had her hoops, glory to Jesus. And it, I mean, she looking good, praise Jesus. And in that moment, I just knew I was going to marry her, right? It just was. It was one of those things. She said hello, and I could not talk for the life of me. It was just one of those crazy moments. But little did I know that 
from these feelings of romantic love that after getting married and having the wonderful honeymoon and all that that comes with it, that right around the corner was going to be a marriage that was not ideal because both of us not only entered into this marriage with idols, but the marriage itself was an idol. The marriage itself was an idol, right? And, and, and most of the time when you use these words of love, it's used in sort of a relationship, right? Whether it's uh, maybe romantic, maybe it's per, per, uh, parental, right? But usually it means these deep feelings of affections, right? Love by definition to us in this culture is an emotion, right? Your role in love is passive. It's something that happens to you, right? Like when we say falling in love, just like it's almost like, you know, you just, you know, I don't know, trip over a rock or something. It just, it's something that happens, right? But under the dark, but, but there's a dark underbelly to this definition of love because if love is an emotion, then what happens when the emotion goes away? Right? See, when we begin to talk about idolatry, when idolatry is integrated into our futures, then when our idols are threatened, then it leads us to paralyzing fear and anxiety. Sorry, guys, pray for me. I'm dealing with uh, allergies this morning. Anyway, I'm all, this message is so deep. Just kidding. <laughs> oh, thank you, baby. Um, I just did that so she'd come up here. Just kidding. Um, right? Uh, and so, uh, and so listen, it's one of those things where uh, if idolatry is integrated into our future, then when our idols are threatened, it leads to fear and anxiety. When our idols are integrated into our past, then when we fail those idols, right, when we failed them, then it led to irreversible guilt. When our idols are integrated into our present life, then when those idols are blocked where we cannot get them, or when those idols are completely removed, then we react in anger, fear, or desperate despair. Wow. Wow. Because an idol is anything that you are willing to sin to get it or to sin to keep it. You see? Yeah. Another way of being able to identify your idols is look at your most uncontrollable emotions. Right? Think about the things that trigger you, things, things that you get defensive really quickly over, right? Think about those things. Somebody say something about your kids. What'd you say? Yeah. Right? Somebody say something about your parenting. Excuse me? You, you know what I'm saying? The, the thing that all of a sudden you get defensive. Nobody can talk to me like that. What, 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 whatever you get defensive over, whatever uncontrollable emotion that's coming out, Ask yourself, if you're angry, ask, why am I so angry? Is there something very important, so important that I'm getting irate over it for some reason? If you're scared, if you're depressed, if you're overworking and driving yourself to the ground frantically, you need to ask yourself, do I feel that I must have this thing in order to be significant? See? Tim Keller says, when you ask questions like that, then what happens is you pull your emotions up by the roots. And what you'll find is often those roots are clinging to an idol in your life. So we're going to talk about it today. Romance and sex and parenting and singleness and marriage. All of these things are good things. All of these things are good things. But when we, when we take our affections and misplace them, when we take these good things and make them ultimate things, whenever you make something other than Jesus Christ an ultimate thing, a thing you have to have or your life is meaningless, you have to have or you're not significant and you have no value, then that means that thing is an idol. So we have some here this morning. We have these romantic candles and roses, right? Ooh. Uh, we have book, this book, Fifty Shades of Grey. Okay. Y'all know what that's in, what's in there for those of you who have read it or saw the movie, but I will not ask you to raise your hands. Um, but a lot of times that gives us definition of what we feel love or romance is about. We have a home here. We have this wonderful box of chocolates. Mm. You know, we have trophies uh, for, uh, for us that are parents that, that want to be proud of our children. We have all kinds of idols in our life. 
And so what I want to do this morning is I just want to talk about love, romance, sex. Then I want to talk about the selfishness of it all. And then I want to talk about the supper. Okay? Number one, love, romance, and sex. See, he starts off by saying, you have heard, do not commit adultery. And then he goes on from there. In other words, he's using an Old Testament statement to build his case. He's using an Old Testament principle, an Old Testament law, thou shalt not commit adultery, to build the case that he's about to present to us. In in other words, in order to understand what it is that Jesus is saying, we have to ask the question, what is the Old Testament sex ethic, right? What is the biblical sex ethic, And I can basically narrow it down to one sentence, which is this, no sex outside of a covenant. Or, to put it positively, only have sex within a covenant. Covenant. Now you say covenant, like that's archaic, we don't use that word. Can you give me some sort of modern word to use besides covenant? And the answer is no, I can't. (laughs) Because (laughs) it really is the only word that really gives us a category of thought. It's not just a word, it's a whole category of thought, right? A covenant creates a relationship, but not just any relationship. It's a relationship that is far more loving and far more intimate than, a, than merely a legal relationship, okay? But it's far more binding and far more enduring than merely an emotional relationship. So it's more than just a legal relationship and it's more than just an emotional relationship. See, a covenant creates a personal relationship which is more intimate and loving because it's legal. It's more loving because it's legal. Let me, let me show you what I mean. You say, how's that? Well, in a consumer relationship, you relate to a vendor, right? You have a relationship as long as the vendor is giving you product at a good price. But you're always looking for a better price. You're always looking for an upgrade, right? And so what you say to the vendor is, we have a relationship, but you better keep adjusting to me because if you don't meet my needs, I'm out of here because my needs are more important than this relationship because it's a consumer relationship, see? And so if I can get my needs met somewhere else, then I'll go there, right? A covenant relationship is exactly opposite of that. See, a consumer relationship says, you adjust to me or I'm out. A covenant relationship says, I'll adjust to you because I have made a promise and the relationship is more important than my needs. Not that my needs aren't important, but but, but the relationship is more important than my needs. You, You see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? In other words, when we have a covenant relationship, what it means is this, and the best way to demonstrate this is God, of course. Right? Because God says this. God says, I will be your God. Here's the agreement. Here's the covenant. I will be your God and you will be my people. Right? But then he goes further. He says, and even when you're not being my people, guess what? I'll still be your God. See, a covenant relationship says, hey, listen, this isn't a contract. This isn't something where if you break your end of the deal, then I get to bring mine end. No, the the covenant says, listen, even when you aren't acting within the covenant, even when there are times where you are acting outside of the covenant, I will still keep my end because this relationship is more important than my needs. See? And this is why, you know, when we talk to Olivia and, and, and my daughters about dating and stuff like that, and all these conversations come up, the reality is, is that they are being bombarded with consumer relationship. And we have to teach them, no, no, let me show you, let me teach you, let me disciple you in what a covenant relationship is. See? Covenant relationship. And when you meet two people, when you have two people that are in a covenant relationship, a few things happen. A few things happen in that space. In that space, there is safety. In that space, there's security. See, in in that space, you can finally be yourself. See, because in a consumer relationship, you're always marketing. You're always selling yourself. You're always having to perform. You're always having to meet the other person's need or they're out. If you don't meet their need, relationship over. They're, They're walking. They're going somewhere else, right? 
But in a covenant relationship, you are able to be safe. You are able to be yourself. You can get rid of the facade. You can finally let them know about your insecurities. You can finally let them know about your deepest, darkest weaknesses. You're finally free to be able to do that in a place, in a space. You can stop spinning. You can stop marketing. You can stop selling. You can, you, you can begin to show who you really are in those spaces. And they can do the same. Because it's a relationship built on grace, you see? It's a relationship built on grace. In fact, this is what the gospel allows. Look at what Pastor Paul Tripp says. He says, the gospel of God's grace is a welcome to personal and community candor. Because we know that nothing can be known, revealed, exposed, or confessed about us that hasn't already been covered by the life, sacrifice, and victory of Jesus Christ. Wow. There isn't anything that I cannot go to Becca about and confess. No dark, deep weakness, no secret, no sin that I cannot confess that has not already been covered by the life, sacrifice, and victory of Jesus Christ. You see? Secondly, in a covenant relationship, ironically, when you're committed to a person in spite of their feelings, deeper feelings grow. When you're committed to a person in spite of their feelings, deeper feelings grow. Parents, you know this, right? Despite the feeling of your child, you can't help but just keep loving them, right? There's deep feelings that grow, right? And third, there's a freedom. Third, there's a freedom. A covenantal relationship brings freedom. Here, believe it or not, I'm relying on Kierkegaard, right? The (laughs) Danish philosopher. Anyway, he does some pretty good stuff. And this is what he says. He puts it like this. He says, listen, and he doesn't use the term consumer relationship, but still, listen to what he says. He says this. If you're in a relationship in which you say, I have to feel it, right? You're not meeting my needs. You know, I have to feel like I love you, right? And if not, then I'm out. He says, if if you are in that kind of relationship, he says, you're not free. You're a slave. You're a slave to your feelings, right? You're a slave to your feelings. You are a puppet on a string to your feelings. He says, and where do your feelings come from? These feelings that you're controlled by. You know, they come from physiology. They come from chemistry. They come from your past and history. Your feelings. Hmm. All of a sudden, your feelings control you. Now, see, here's the thing about feelings is feelings, they should be indicators of reality but they should never be fabricators of reality. They can be indicators of reality. We're, we're not saying ignore your feelings, but they, but they shouldn't fabricate your reality. See? Wow. But if you're in a consumer relationship, then that's, all, then, then, that's what it's, then that's what it's all about. It's about meeting your needs, and it's all about you and how they make you feel. And if that's not happening, then out. See, our culture has made sex a consumer good, but the Bible says that sex wasn't designed to be a consumer good. It was designed to be a covenant good, good. right? you, You see what I'm saying? See, in a covenant, you've made a promise. Sex has become like a sacrament, See, a sacrament is, is a, a symbol, right? It's a symbol. It's an external symbol of an invisible reality. This is why it's so meaningful. See, when you have sex inside a covenant relationship, it becomes a vehicle in which you are engaging the whole person, the whole person, everything. See, In marriage, when I make myself physically naked and vulnerable, it's a sign of what I've done, not just physically, but it's a sign what I've done with my wife for my whole life. My whole life is vulnerable to her. That's what it's supposed to be a sign of. It's supposed to point that, listen, I'm not just physically vulnerable, right? But I'm being emotionally vulnerable, mentally vulnerable. My whole life is vulnerable to you. That's what it's supposed to point to. That's what it's supposed to represent. It's a sign of what I've done with my whole life, you see. 
That's the reason why sex outside of a covenant relationship, according to the Bible, it lacks integrity. Because you're asking somebody to do with their body what you're not willing to do with your life. You're saying, I I want you to be vulnerable with me physically, but I won't be vulnerable in any other place. See? C.S. Lewis puts it perfectly when he says this. He says, the monstrosity of sexual intercourse outside of marriage is that those who engage in it are trying to isolate one kind of union, the sexual, from all other kinds of union, which were intended to go along with it and make up a total union. See? To have physical union without having whole life union is a lack of integrity. Do you see what I'm saying? Wow. Our relationships can be covenant or can be consumer. And we have to ask ourselves, where's our idol lie in this? There are very, that there's a very carefully worded article in the New York Times that was written by various clinical psychologists named The Downside of Cohabitating Before Marriage. This is interesting. The, co- the downside of cohabitating before marriage, all right? And in it, it points out that there are more and more studies showing that people who live together before they get married, watch this, are more likely to divorce than people who don't. Hmm. Now, that's not what our culture teaches us, right? Our culture teaches us actually, well, no, I think if you live together first, then you're kind of finding, before you get married, you kind of find out if you're compatible with each other. I mean, that's kind of the point, right? You want to find out, wait a minute, I don't want to say yes just yet. Let, let's, see if, let's see if this works. Let's see if we're compatible. That's what the culture says. But actually, what the science says is that's actually not true, right? That, that, it, that actually, it, it, it's impossible. And here's why, right? Is because those who live together, this article says that, Men and women, they agree that the standards of a, of a live-in partner are lower than the standards if you were to marry them. If you live together, if you co-live together, you don't have the same standard as that pers- on that person that you would if they were your husband or if they were your wife. Right? And so because the standard is not there, it doesn't prepare you. At all. See? It's quiet in here. And so people feel like it's a never-ending audition to be this person's spouse. You're always having to be on. It's a consumer relationship. Why? Because in this, you're always thinking, oh, can I do better? Somewhere in your mind, you're thinking that. See, I'm seeing if we work, I'm seeing if this works out, because maybe, the, maybe there's some, maybe it won't, maybe, maybe there's someone else, we can do better, I can do better, right? Trying to find out if you're compatible, which is a nice way of saying, I'm trying to find out if this person's good enough to marry me. See, and what is sex in a situation like that? Well, it's marketing, it's attracting, It's enticing. It's trying to keep the relationship going. It's not trusting and resting. It's not giving, which which means this, sex outside of a covenant, it it no way prepares you for sex inside of a covenant. It's not the same thing, see? What they're doing in cohabitation is that they're learning to live together as consumers instead of givers because it's all about how they make you feel. Can they fit into my life? Marriage has become something that you add as a portfolio of your life. You see? Marriage is, you you don't, you know, you you get married if if it fits, if if it's something that, you know, helps you. If it's something that makes your life look more attractive or makes you look like you have it together or makes you look like you're more mature. Hmm. I know this is absolutely countercultural and counterintuitive, but guys, this is just the first point of the message. <laughs> the integrity of sex is there must be an integrity between body and life. 
body, and life. And this has been challenging and difficult. And here's why. Because of selfishness. Because of selfishness. See, the, the, all of these surface sort of uh, idols, really what's underneath that, what, what's driving that, what, 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 what's taking it and feeding it is this deeper idol of selfishness. Number two, selfishness. Jesus says, listen, now, uh, you know, you, you've heard uh, that if you commit adultery, that that's bad. But look what he says. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. Now, what about that? Right? Whenever I engage with um, any sort of Muslim conversation, and sometimes what happens is they say, oh, well, listen, uh, Christianity, uh, when Jesus comes along, it, it's not strict enough. It's not holy enough, you know, because, because they talk about all of these sort of regulations and rules that, that they have within their community. And, and, and a lot of times I'll point to this verse. They say, what are you talking about? Look what Jesus did. He didn't lower the standard. He raised the bar. He said, even if you think it, you've done it. Well, how in the world, Jesus, am I supposed to do that? Right? I mean, if that's the case, then we're never going to be holy enough. Oh, that's the point. See, that's the point. But see, most people in our culture, when they hear that Jesus says this, what they think that Jesus is saying is, if you have any kind of attraction, if you're, if you're physically attracted to somebody, then that's terrible and you're going to hell. That's what most people think Jesus is saying. But that's not what he's saying. First of all, we, we know that being attracted to somebody is not a horrible thing. That, 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 that sex in itself is not bad. Why? Because God invented it. Yeah. Right. He created it. Right. I mean, you know, it starts off, to the, the second longest poem in all of scripture is a love poem that happens in the Garden of Eden and with, with a naked man and a naked woman, and he's singing this song to her. And that's just where it begins, Right? No, no, no. When he uses that word has already lusted, when, he, when you lust after somebody, that word's a very unique Greek word that, that really is used when talking about idols and specifically when talking about greed and selfishness. Greed and selfishness. It's a unique word that means idolatry, particularly selfishness. So in the same way that you're looking at romance or sex or love to get you what only God can give you, when that happens, it comes out, it, it begins to be displayed in all sorts of ways. Y'all ready for this? Yeah. Okay. I told, I told the first service they're going to feel like they're on a roller coaster without a seatbelt. Number one, bam, pornography and masturbation. See, remember... When we talked about sex as a consumer good, it, that, that, that if it's in a covenant relationship, it's about giving, right? It's about serving. It's not just about receiving. It's not just about self-fulfillment. Well, pornography and masturbation, that, that's the exact opposite. It, it's, that's all about self-fulfillment. I mean, there's not even another person, right? It's just you, right? And all it is is you being in control, that, that's really what it is. See, the addiction to pornography isn't really the lust. It's the power that we become addicted to. The, the, the immediate, the, 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 the immediate uh, uh, um, thing that makes it fulfilled right then, the instant gratification that happens. How you want it, when you want it, you want it now, wow. right? Just like that little girl in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and there's all those geese and they're laying the golden eggs. She's like, I want it now, right? Singing that song and flipping you know, the candy around or whatever she's doing, <laughs> right? We want it and we want it now. That's what this is happening, right? I mean, this is what pornography and masturbation is. It's consumer good par excellence. That's what's happening. You have it the way you want it and the particular kinds you want it. It's everything the Bible says that sex is not supposed to be. It's the exact opposite. Is it addicting? Sure. But why? Because it's selfish. It's selfish. It's selfish. Wow. Jeez. And see, this is why it's hard to lay our sexuality down at the feet of Jesus and say, here, God, it is yours. 
Because our culture does not understand that not everything that uh, describes you defines you. See, we want to take our sexuality and make it so core to our identity. But not everything that describes us defines us. Your sexuality is not at the core of who you are. But regardless, everything we put at the feet of Jesus Everything we lay at the feet of Jesus, homosexuality, heterosexuality, bisexuality, anything in between, all sexuality needs to be put at the feet of Jesus and say, here, God, this is yours. This is yours. You invented sexuality. You invented sex. You need to tell me what this is supposed to look like. What my whole life is supposed to look like. What spending money is supposed to look like. What being friends with is supposed to look like. How I'm to conduct myself at work. What's that supposed to look like? Everything, every part of my life. And sex is included. But for many people, they don't put it down. They don't put it down. And for many churches, we go around and we preach this message that, that says, listen, if you're homosexual, we want you to get saved so you can become heterosexual. What are you talking about? It's not like, oh, well, you become heterosexual and all of a sudden that means you're guaranteed salvation. That's not what gets you into the kingdom of God is being heterosexual. That doesn't get rid of your sexual problems. No, heterosexuals have problems too. All of it needs to, it's not like, oh, the homosexual can't go out and live how they want to, but the heterosexual can. No, they can't. None of us can. We be, why? Because as one Arthur puts it, it's not about homosexuality or heterosexuality, but about holy sexuality. You see? Holy sexuality. What's another way that this selfish idol comes out inside of us, right? How about this? Just the belief that you cannot be a whole person or a happy person without someone else. Always having to be in relationship, always having to look for somebody else. Because that's what makes you whole. That's what makes you happy. Why are you going to walk out now, babe? <laughs> She's all, that's right. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> right? When you say, listen, I have to have this, I, I, I have to, because that's what makes me happy, then, 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 then it's become an idol, you see? It's become an idol. When, when you say, well, yes, I need God, but I also need God and this other thing. Yes, I need God to make me happy, and yes, I need God to give me peace, and yes, I need God to give me joy, and yes, I need God for, but I also need, well, whatever the also need is, that's an idol. It's an idol, you see? Not that other things can't make you happy and other things can't give you joy and things can't relax you or give you Of course they can. But that can't be your ultimate source. You can't anchor your heart in that, right? You can't put all your stock in that. When you do, then that thing's an idol, you see. For some of you, you think, well, listen, if I'm not married, then I'm nothing. Come on, say that. See, not only can sex become an idol, but the church has made marriage an idol. The church has made marriage. As if the mission statement of the church is, let's get all the single people married. Right? But a lot of places do that, right? We all do it. We're guilty of it. Right? We get together, and what do we want to do? Find out from the single person, well, what's going on? What, what dating app are you on? For, for those of you who are single, when you go to, you know, family holidays or whatever, what's bound to come up? You know, you dating anybody yet? You got married yet? What's going on? Right? It comes up because marriage has even become an idol. Listen, the Christian view of singleness has always been that it is a viable paradigm for the adult life. Howard Stanley at Duke University has written a couple of classic essays on the subject called Community of Character. And in it, he says this, Christianity was the very first religion or worldview that held single adulthood up as a viable way of life. This is one of the clear differences in Christianity and all other religions or worldviews. Wow. In the essay, he points out, for example, that Tiberius Caesar put into law that if there is a widow under a certain age, that that widow must be remarried within two years. 
Why? Because in that culture and in that society, you had to be married. That was your value. That made you important. That was, that, that's, that's what you grew up doing. That's what you were raised to do. And you had to have kids and you had to have heirs, right? It was about legacy. And so there's this law put in place. But when you read the New Testament, you'll find out that not only were widows not forced to remarry, but this is what's radical. The Christians had to care for them. Support them, not tell them to get remarried, but be, they can remain single and the Christians had to come together and support the widows. See, complete distinction, complete opposite of the worldview that was around them. What does it mean? It means it's okay to be single. Not only is it okay, but Paul says, Paul says, Paul says that he wishes none of us were married. Y'all remember reading that in the Bible? Right? That might be a good, never mind, I'm not gonna, never mind. Right? Or, and, and, and I know, I know, every time we talk about singleness, this comes up, but it's because it's so good and it's so true. But Jesus Christ himself, right? Right? right. The ultimate expression of perfect humanity. Here he is, the ultimate expression of perfect humanity. He did not feel the need to get married in order to express it. Sam Alderberry, who is a, uh, oh, sorry, Alberry, who is a pastor, apologist, author, and speaker. He's the author of a number of books, including Is God Anti-Gay? What God Has to Say About Our Bodies? Why Does God Care Who I Sleep With? Seven Myths About Singleness and More. Listen to what he says. In the resurrection to come, and so that's a doctrine that we believe in, that, that not only was Jesus Christ physically resurrected, but when he comes back, the Bible says that everybody will rise up. Everybody will rise up. You see, heaven is going to be a supernatural but very physical reality. And he says, in the resurrection to come, there is something ontological about your gender, but not about your sexuality. Meaning, when we're all raised again, living in the age to come, we won't be raised with the same sexual instincts, feelings, and temptations that we experience in this life. Thank God. These things are not part of our eternal experience. Therefore, I do not want to sink my deepest sense of identity into something that is temporal rather than something that is eternal. I am more defined by my future than my past. Lastly, on how the idol of selfishness comes up is when you look at love, in your mind, do you have a fairy tale dream of a perfect wedding? and of a perfect marriage. Yeah. Come on. Is that somewhere there? Even for those of you who have been married for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, you still somewhere in the back of your mind have this perfect marriage uh, reality that's somewhere there. And then what happens is when you look at your marriage and you look at that sort of fantasy and you compare them, then you get frustrated because there is an expectation that has been planted there that you're not seeing. And, if, and that's just how it is. If you say, well, listen, if I had a perfect marriage, if I had perfect children, if I had a perfect home, then my life would be good. If that's what you think, then guess what? Your marriage and your children and your home are all idols. Wow. See, your marriage can be an idol. Your marriage can be an idol. Your spouse can be an idol. See, your marriage can be an idol, your spouse can be an idol. Your marriage can be an idol, sure, of course, right? Think about it, on Instagram, Facebook, wherever you post, it's not like you go and you record the fight that you're having and then post that. <laughs> of course not. You can be in the middle of fighting, somebody snaps a shot, you smile real quick, and that's what you're gonna post. Right, Why? Hey. Why? Why do you do that? Three. Well, because we want other people to think we have a good marriage. Why? Well, because we've tethered some sort of identity or value to that. You know, I don't want people to think I'm a bad husband. I don't want people, because if they think I'm a bad husband, they're going to think I'm a bad person. If they think I'm a bad person, they're going to reject me. And I don't want rejection because acceptance is my idol. Right. Oh, you see? That's good. You see? Or, or your spouse can be an idol. See, you can begin to demand things from them that God doesn't even demand from them. When, when, when you make them your source of joy and your source of peace, and, 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 and if they don't meet your needs, and if they're not making you happy, and if they're not giving you peace, and if they're not giving you patience, and all this stuff, and be, be, and, and then there's frustration that happens because you've placed that on them. You're demanding something from them that only God can give you. You see? 
That's what happens. And then when that doesn't happen, you guys fight. I mean, what happens if I come home and I'm mad and I'm upset and I'm depleted and I need my wife to make me feel better? I've had a long day and I need her to be patient with me and I I need her to not get frustrated, so I walk in frustrated. But what happens if she's frustrated? What happens if she's depleted? And now she needs me not to be frustrated, right? Well, then we just end up fighting. And the next thing you know, you know, she's mad and then, and then I'm mad because she's mad, right? She's frustrated and I'm frustrated because she's, I mean, we fight about that all the time, right? We tell each other, wait a minute, when I'm frustrated, you're supposed to be calm. That never works, <laughs> right? Why? Because we're selfish, that's why. We are selfish. Parents, your children can be your idol. Not only can they be your idol, but they can reveal your idols. Paul Tripp lays out a few ways this can happen. Number one, he says one way that can happen is respect. Respect's a good thing, but when we make respect an ultimate thing, it becomes an idol. And so he talks about this story of a father who stomped on every one of his daughter's CDs. He had locked her in her room every night and publicly shared her sins with the whole church at a prayer meeting. He slapped her in the face in front of her friends and tried, uh, and tried to beat her into submission. He never failed to remind her that he had not been given the model teen. And he, has, and he said, I will get the respect if it's the last thing I do because I'm owed that. From that point on, life became a series of final exams in which he never gave his daughter better than an F. He viewed all of the development, insecurities, and awkwardness of his daughter as a personal front. There was no vertical spiritual dimension to his thinking. How he saw his daughter was not in terms of her relationship to God, but only in terms of relationship to himself. Wow. Now, as a parent, for those who are parents, maybe you've never went this far. Maybe you have. Uh, For those of you who have parents, maybe you know what this is like and you've experienced this or something similar to this. See, and when you really begin to find out what the problem is, it's not just so much the the, the respect that that's a problem, it's the fact that, you know, you were embarrassed. You see, when you go to think about it in times where maybe you've yelled at your kids or you've lashed out, right? Why, why did you do that? Well, but maybe because you were embarrassed. Why were you embarrassed? Well, because, you know, they did something in front of other people and, and, and now they're embarrassed. And why does that matter? Well, because you, what other people's opinion about you, you care about. You've made other people's opinion an idol, you see. What about Appreciation. There's going to be things as parents that you do that you're never going to get appreciated for. You know, all the diaper changes, all the staying up late at night, making sure, you know, it's not going to happen. And so when it doesn't happen, when, 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 you know, your child gets angry or talks back or whatever, what do you do? You clap back, you talk back, you yell, you scream, you talk down to them, you curse, you call them names. Why? Because you were disappointed and you were depressed and you were frustrated. Why? Because you didn't feel appreciated because appreciation is your idol. How about success? We have these trophies up here, beautiful trophies, right? Nothing wrong with trophies. That's great. They're good. But when you make those ultimate things, and that's exactly what we do, because listen, if our kids are successful, then we're successful. That's how we feel. And if our kids are getting bad grades in class, do we get mad because because we really want them to succeed? Or are we mad because we don't want to look like we're the bad parent? We don't want to look like we're incompetent. We don't want to get the phone call from the teacher, you see, we don't want to go and, 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 and meet with other people and, and, and when, they say, when everybody starts talking about what their kids are doing and stuff and how fantastic their kids are and you have to say, well, you know. Because somewhere you've tethered your identity, you've tethered your value. Somewhere inside of you, there's anger or there's guilt or there's shame and Jesus Christ is here to set you free of that. You see? And so you've pushed them and you pushed them and you were hard on them and you were hard on them because their success was your success. The idol of control. The idol of control. You know, you get to a place where you control everything they do when they're first born. But as they begin to grow up, you have less and less and less control. And so pretty soon you start, you start getting fearful Why? Why are you fearful? Because you're no longer in control. 
healthy. Some of you who have parents, listen, your parent is an idol. Their acceptance of you, their being proud of you, you have, you have run your whole life trying to get them to accept you, trying to get them to be proud of you. And no matter how hard you try, no matter what you do, they're just, it's just not there. And so you run yourself ragged. Why? Because you want their acceptance. For many of us, we've made family an idol. We've made family an idol. Some of us say, well, I can't go to a meetup because it's on Sunday, and right after church on Sundays is family day. Every Sunday is family day. And so I can't go to the meetup with the other church because I have my family. We do that every Sunday, and we're not going to break it. Well, let me just show you something that Jesus does. Look at this, Matthew chapter 12, verse 46 and 50. It says, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mothers and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Okay. Someone told him, Hey, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. Now, look at this. He replied to them, who's my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mothers and here are my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. Now, what is Jesus saying? Is Jesus saying, listen, no, that family, you know, your, 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 your blood brother, your blood mother, your, you know, your adoptive parents, what, you know, whatever it is, that that's not real. No, he's not saying that. He's saying, yes, that's family, but that's not your only family. He's saying, you need to know that you have two families. See, the people sitting in front of you and, and behind you and to the side of you right now, that if they are Christian, if they are saved, then guess what? They are your brother and they are your sister as well. See, but the reason that we make things like sex or marriage or families, parents and children, the reason we make all of these things idols is because we have forgotten about the supper. The supper. If you notice at the passage that we first read, Jesus says something kind of extreme. He says, listen, if your right eye sins, pluck it out because it's better for you to be missing that part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. He says, if your right hand sins, chop it off because it's better for you to miss that part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Now, is he, you know, being extreme? Uh, yes, he is. Is he using hyperbole to bring about a point? Yes, of course he is. What is he trying to get us to do? He's trying to get us to see the future. He's trying to get us to understand that your reality isn't just here, but there's actually a deeper reality that's in the future to come. See? He says it's better than for your whole body to be in hell. He uses the word Gehenna there. Gehenna was an actual place. It was an actual place in Jerusalem where they would burn garbage. And in there, it gets this idea of a place that's unquenchable thirst and unfulfilled longing. See, we are built to know Jesus Christ. And therefore, if we reject God, then we reject the ability to have our deepest needs satisfied, which means you will never ever find what you are deeply longing to find. Ever. See? G Jesus tells this, this woman at the well that, that, listen, I have water for you to drink and, and, and if you drink this water, you'll never thirst again. Remember that? He, in, 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 in other words, he says, I can satisfy the deepest needs, those unfulfilled longings, those needs. I can satisfy them. And, and do you remember what he said? She said, well, sir, give me this water. And do you remember what he said to her? He said, well, go get your husband. Remember that? And, and, and she said, well, Jesus, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, yeah, that's right. You had five husbands and the guy you're with now is kind of a side thing that you're kind of doing something with, right? Why, why would he bring up her messed up sex life? Why would he do that? Oh, because he's saying, listen, what you're looking for, the thing that you keep chasing after, the thing that is this deep, long desire in your heart, you're looking in all the wrong places and in all the wrong spaces. That's what he's saying. 
He's saying, I have water that if you drink, you'll never thirst again. See, we've, have, we've misplaced our affections. We've put our affections that are meant to be, these deep affections that are meant to be poured out on Jesus. We, we, we've put them into other things and made other things ultimate things. See? He says, I want you to think about the future. Well, if that's the case, what's the future for us? As a Christian, what's our future? Well, the Bible says that the future, in the future, that there will be this thing called the marriage supper of the Lamb. At the marriage supper of the Lamb, there we will feast, we will dine, we will be with Christ forever. What does that mean? Oh, my friend, it means that everything that is spiritually true now will manifest itself in a reality that is hard to articulate or comprehend. What are you talking about, Pastor Roger? What I'm talking about is this. You see, you go and you want to make parents your idol. You, you want to make children your idol. You want to be the best parent or you want to make your parent proud. And, and, and if you don't have that, then you're nothing. Well, Jesus says, I'm your father and you are my children. I can, I can fulfill this deepest longing. See, we want to make marriage and relationship and romance an idol and say, if we don't have that, we don't have anything. But Jesus says, listen, I am your groom and you are my bride. You can find it in me. Do, do you see that? We want to make family or idol. In the, and Jesus says, listen, you're the, those that are, that are going to be feasting at this table with you, they are your brothers and they are your sisters. And until you understand that reality, until you find that fulfillment in Jesus, you're never going to be fulfilled. And so because of that, you're always going to find your place lashing out on somebody, holding bitterness and unforgiveness. You're always going to find yourself running after something, and even when you get it, it still doesn't satisfy. Why? Because somebody said this once, until Jesus is enough, nothing else will be. Until Jesus is enough, nothing else will be. Would you stand to your feet? See, you'll always be trying to find it somewhere else and in someone else. Always. I wonder this morning if some of us, when listening to this message, maybe you've identified your, 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 yourself somewhere. Maybe you're single and, and you've made something an, an idol. Maybe you're married and you've made something an idol. Maybe you're a parent and you've made something an idol. Maybe you're not a parent and, and, and you desire to have kids and you've made that an idol. Whatever the situation is, you know, uh, uh, maybe you're, 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 you're a parent and, and trying to get their approval and you've made that an idol in your life. Maybe you've made acceptance an idol, respect an idol, be in control an idol. Being accepted and not rejected. Maybe you've made that an idol. And, and because of that, you've behaved in ways because you are a slave to your emotions. And Jesus says, I want you to be free. You say, how do you do that, Pastor Roger? By taking your misplaced affections and putting it back on him saying, Jesus, I love you. Amen. Let's do that now.
false saviors to come in and we try to put our trust in those things and our identity in those things and our value in those things but Lord none of those can satisfy none of those can meet the reality of the condition of our hearts and so Lord we 
take those things off of center, even things that are good things, parenting, marriage, singleness, romance, sex, good things. But Lord, we take them from the place of ultimate things and we put you front and center. And Heavenly Father, help us do this every day. I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Super excited next Sunday. Pastor Phil is uh, closing out our series. You do not want to miss the topic. It's going to be good. Love you guys. Have an amazing week.